discipleship. We continue our study, the 12th week of our study, if you can believe that. Uh, uh, time is flying in, in this most <laughs> weird time. But we're studying this most vital and fundamental subject. You know, our, our study has centered around the idea of what does it ultimately mean to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. And as we've noted with really a lot of redundancy, a disciple is a follower. A disciple is a learner. A disciple is an imitator of their teacher. And certainly the context of this particular study being the relationship between that of a child of God, a Christian, and our teacher, our master, the perfect example, Jesus Christ, the one that, that we're striving to be. The disciple is striving in any and all ways to be just like Jesus. And that, that's quite the bar that has been set, no doubt, as, as he was perfect. And as we've noticed, pictures of discipleship, what, what it means to be a disciple is all over God's word. He doesn't leave us guessing as to what it is that ultimately pleases him. Uh, Luke chapter 9 and verse 23 has been, I guess you could say, our foundation text. And it, it speaks, I, I think, to the serious uh, nature uh, of all of this. It, it speaks to the sacrificial, all-in uh, nature of this most special life, um, changing, consuming relationship, I guess you might say. If you have your Bibles open, turn with me to Luke uh, chapter 9, a, a passage that, that we've looked at so much in, in this study. Luke chapter 9, let's look at it again this morning as, as we begin. Luke chapter 9 at verse 23, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, it says, and he, was saying, and he was saying to them all, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Verse 24 says, for whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake, he is the one who will save it. What is man profiting if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself. Forever is ashamed, verse 26, of me and my words. The Son of Man will be ashamed of him. And when he comes in glory, in the glory of the Father and the holy angels, verse 27 says, but I say to you truthfully, there's some of those who are standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. Jesus says here, the disciple must be willing to deny himself, must be willing to take up his cross daily and follow him. Brethren, that's the essence of discipleship. It's following after Jesus. It's being willing to deny yourself with the understanding that it's not always going to be easy. That Jesus said, just as they hated you, hated me, they're, they're going to hate you as well as you follow me. So this morning, I, I want to look at another picture, another aspect of what it truly means to be a disciple of Jesus. And it doesn't get any more practical than our study this morning. So let's build our study this morning around a, a statement. A disciple of Jesus Christ knows what they believe, knows why they believe it, and let's add this, has the ability to communicate it to others. Let me say that again. A disciple of Jesus Christ knows what they believe, why they believe it, and has the ability to communicate it to others. Now, let's be clear. As we've said many times, even in this study, we all have different gifts, different talents. There's, there's no doubt that there will be those who have better abilities by way of communicating to others. Uh, what and why they believe. But I believe that at some level, level, every disciple of Christ should have the ability to in some way communicate and defend their faith. Because I don't think, I don't think the Holy Spirit would, would command us to do something that we are incapable of doing. We know that's not true. In 1 Peter chapter 3, I want you to turn over there with me this morning. And I want you to look at verse 15 of this text. And we'll let this passage kind of drive us um, this morning. 1 Peter chapter 3. Well, let's start back up at verse 13. 1 Peter 3, look at verse 13. Who is there to harm you if you prove zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed. Listen to this. And do not fear their intimidation and don't be troubled. But sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. Uh, let's break this down, verse down. You know, to, to a people suffering persecution as a result of their faith, the apostle Peter Led by the Holy Spirit, he admonishes these brethren, and subsequently us, to be an apologist by way of our faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus admonishes these brethren in the face of persecution, don't fear their intimidation. Don't you be troubled. Instead, listen to this, verse 15 again, right there in the middle of the phrase, we'll look at that first. He says, always be ready to make a defense to everyone who asks for an account of your hope. Ready to make a defense. 
And that word defense comes from the Greek word apologia. And that word means to give a formal defense of what you believe. You know, we can see this idea demonstrated in the life of the Apostle Paul. In Philippians chapter 1, starting at verse 15, the Apostle Paul would describe his ministry by saying, some to be sure of preaching Christ, even from envy and strife, but some also from goodwill. Verse 16 says, the latter do it of love, knowing that I am appointed, listen to this, for the defense of the gospel. There's our word. In Acts chapter 17, as Paul was traveling about preaching the gospel of Christ, he would describe his work by saying there in verse 2, and according to Paul's custom, he went to them and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining, listen to what Paul did, and giving evidence that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead and saying, this Jesus whom I'm claiming to you is the Christ. The Bible says that Paul was explaining. He was given evidence. In other words, he was making a defense for what he believed to be the truth. What about you? What about me? Do we have the ability to do that? Are we missing out on on opportunities that that God is presenting us with, that we're, we're praying for? You know, when your friend asks you at work, why? Are you able to tell them? Are you able to tell them and explain to them the hope that you have and why you have that hope? The basis for the way you live your life, the basis for the decisions that you make. Can you tell them about Jesus, what he's done for you, what he requires of you, why you respond the way that you do to your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? Can can, can you talk to them about what grace is and how it motivates every aspect of of your life. You know, I believe in this passage, we gain really a practical look at, at what it takes to be ready to give a defense of the hope that is in us. So, number one, Peter says, I, I think here, to be ready to give a defense, first, we must sanctify Christ as Lord in our hearts. Uh, let me ask you, what does it mean to sanctify Christ as Lord in our hearts? You know, sanctify means to, to make It means to hallow, or it means to make holy. It's to consecrate, or to set apart. To set apart. I I want you to think about your own decision-making process. You know, we we make all kinds of of decisions, really on a daily basis. And in our hearts, our minds, we we really have all of these voices. Uh, We have cultural voices and influence. We have uh, familial voices. We, We have our own will to contend with, the flesh. And no doubt, there are times in our lives and when we fight the urge, we, we, we have an urge to please others. We have an urge to be popular. And all of these voices are competing for the final say in our minds as we make these de- decisions. Let me ask you, is there a voice or an influence in your mind that stands out? You know, for many, it's grandpa or it's mom. or For others, it's, it's self. Here's the problem. There can only be one throne, according to the Apostle Peter here, as he's led by the Holy Spirit. And it was Jesus who who said famously in Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, we've looked at this passage in this study, that no one can serve two masters, for either he'll hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You can't serve God and wealth. In other words, there's only one throne. Christ, his way. Is he sitting on the throne of of your heart? Let's put this another way. To sanctify Christ as Lord in your heart is to set him apart and to set him above all those other voices, all those other influences. Now now notice something else here, and I alluded to this a moment ago. Make no mistake about it, this is a command. The sanctification is not something God does for us in spite of ourselves. It's not something the Holy Spirit irresistibly does to us apart from our own intentions. It's not done by accident. It's an act of our own will. We make the decision to sanctify Christ as Lord in our hearts. Uh, Brother Rogers in his book, The Portraits of Discipleship, has been helping us through the study. He would say in regards to this idea, and I love it. He says, with Jesus seated upon the throne of our heart, we will respond to him in obedience and confidence, believing that his teaching is worth defending. I I love that. Sanctify Christ as Lord in your heart. He's the master. He's the final say. But then he adds this, we must always be ready. Go back in our text in 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 15. He says, but sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts. Then he says this, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give it a hope, to give an account for the hope that is in you. In other words, brethren, we must have the ability to answer the why. You know, for these people, 
Why continue to suffer for your faith? Hell does for us. Why continue to suffer for our faith? Why, why continue to insist on Bible authority, even in the middle of a pandemic? Why insist on book, chapter, and verse for everything we do and say? Why is grace so powerful and influential in our lives and the decisions that we make? Why, right? Why do we believe what we believe? Why do we stand for what we stand for? You know, ultimately, all of these answers come back to our hope. We believe that heaven is reserved for the faithful who respond to God's grace in an appropriate way. And we have a desire that transcends everything else to be among that faithful on the day our Lord returns. Are you ready to make that defense? Here's what I know. The ability to be an apologist is not just going to happen. You know, sometimes I wonder if we think of ourselves as the apostles. You remember they were promised that the words would come to them, that they would know what to say. They'd be given, these words they would be given, being the high the Holy Spirit, what to say. And, and brethren, in the sense that the Holy Spirit is going to miraculous take us over and reveal to us what to say, that's not how it works. That promise was for them, uh, not for us. You know, the Holy Spirit has been revealed through those chosen men, but we have a responsibility to get in God's word what they have revealed by the Holy Spirit and gain the necessary knowledge and wisdom to fulfill this command to defend. Get this. Readiness requires preparation, and preparation requires diligence and sacrifice. And how about this? Almost precious commodity. It's going to take some time. And if Christ is not Lord of your heart, you'll never see the value of that type of diligence and that type of sacrifice. And in turn, you'll always lack the ability to make your defense. And I'll tell you what's tragic about that. We're missing out on opportunities to play this most pivotal role in sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ, ultimately saving people's soul. In 2 Timothy 2 at verse 15, the apostle Paul would tell Timothy, be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. That doesn't just happen. Sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts. Always be ready. Do this with the proper attitude. Let's add that. Back in our text at verse 15, but sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you. Listen to this. Yet with gentleness and reverence. Yet with gentleness. Your, your version may say, yet with meekness. Brethren, we are never to be arrogant or resentful in our defense. We're never to be combative in our defense. You know, this word being strength under control, it was used to describe a horse who could be controlled with a bridle and a bit. We've got to bring our emotions, any anger or malice, under complete control so not to spoil the effectiveness of the presentation. You know, in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15, Paul says, but speaking the truth in love were to grow up in all aspects into him who has had even Christ. Colossians 4, at verse 6 says, let your speech always be with grace, as though seasoned with salt. We looked at this last week, so that you will know how you should respond to each person. Certainly, humility plays a part in this. And I would argue as sinners who have been desperate who are, continue to be desperate for, for the grace of God, we ought to be most humble by way uh, of our defense, not compromising, not weak, but gentle, under control. But not only is our defense, he says, to be, uh, to be set with gentleness, he says, but also reverence. Given an account for the hope that is in you with gentleness and reverence. Brother, I, I think this has to do largely with our attitude toward God and his word. Now, 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 certainly we're to be respectful toward those who uh, were defending, making our defense too, no doubt about that. But I think this has to do with more our attitude toward God and his word. You know, our, our audience needs to see and understand that, that we take God, that we take his word seriously, that we understand the difference between our opinion and God's word. And, and we shouldn't get too hung up on opinions. Let's just go back to the word of God and let's hold it up right? Now, as we close this morning, I want you to look at verse 16. Well, we'll start back at verse 15 and read it together. He says, but sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that's in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. Now look at verse 16. And keep a good conscience, so that in a thing which you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ, he says, will be put 
to shame. You know, I think people are looking for confidence. They, they need to see a person who is confident in their faith and in their knowledge of God's word. But we must realize that they're also looking for consistency. But this goes back to our time together last Sunday as we looked at the power of influence from Matthew chapter 5. You see, our life, our behavior needs to match our message. We need to live what we preach. I, I'll end with this statement. And, and I think you know this to be true, and you've heard me say this before. I, I believe with all of my heart that nothing is more devastating upon our influence than the sin of hypocrisy. A disciple of Christ, they know what they believe. They know why they believe it. They have the ability to defend it. Let's add this. They live it. Sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts. Always be ready to give a defense of your hope. Do it with the proper attitude and be authentic. That's what disciples of Jesus Christ do. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, Father, thank you so much for this study, for, for all of those who have been so diligent in participating in it. Father, we pray that as we allow your word to plant in our hearts, as we strive to be like your son, Father, we pray for fruit. We pray for opportunities. We, we pray that you would bless us with opportunities to defend our faith. And Father, give us the desire, give us the wisdom to, to be in your word on a daily basis and to apply it to our lives. And as, and as we see the difference that it's making in our lives, Father, we, we know that that's going to just create a fire in us to share it with others so that they can experience what we've experienced in your son, Christ Jesus. Father, forgive us of our sins. We, we fall short often. Father, you're most aware of this. For your grace, for your mercy, for your willingness to forgive us our sins, Father. We, we love you and are just so thankful. Father, bless us this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.